Hello, this is Charlene Campbell and it's the most beautiful day today. The sun has just been shining but not too hot and the wind has been blowing. I don't know if you can see the trees out there. Just a nice steady blow. <laughs> anyway, I it's my day to share. I hope you're well. I have two, two things I want to talk to you about today and um, as I've been pondering, what would be the most helpful thing I could share? And uh, the two things that came to my mind were that I wanted to follow up with some of the medicine um, that I've been making with Mother Earth, my foraging and drying and then medicine creation. I just want to show you some of the things, the next step I'm going to do with these. And if you want to check out the first video, look up Herbal Wildcrafting with Charlene on my YouTube channel. Please like my video and um, subscribe if you're not subscribed. Um, it helps it to get more circulated so that people can learn about the natural um, ways to respond safely to out of hospital birth in unexpected circumstances and low resource settings. That's my, that's my channel that it's about. Okay, so today we're going to talk more about herbs because herbs and self-reliance and sustainability are also part of that whole um, picture. So the second thing we're going to do today is I started a list of um, things that a assistant should know, someone who's helping someone in an out-of-hospital setting, whether planned or unplanned. I think in the future a lot of it will be planned because the hospitals will be packed with people that are too sick and it won't be safe for the mother to be there having a baby. And so that's when, you know, people are going to have to get resourceful, <laughs> get rid of the Hollywood fear and start learning some really practical knowledge. That's actually what gets rid of fear. A lot of it is just the really the truth. The truth um, sets you free and it also dispels fear. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is... I'm going to take the rose oil that we made and it's it's really absorbed a lot of the the oils and um see i'm going to go ahead and just pour it through this sieve and see how that works out and then i'm going to take a spoon the rose petals they've all kind of gone crispy that's what happens when you put them in the oil it draws the properties out and then they kind of kind of go a little crispy kind of cool so you can really work that out see and i'm just going to stick these right there so we continue cooking a bit and then i'm just going to show you so i have these nice bottles that are um i have reusable labels and i have um, and they're dark they're glass they have little droppers some of them don't so you can get them with and i'm just gonna pour what i can you have to really watch because they fill up really quick um, that's probably full so maybe i'm gonna do two with rows and then um I've got a bit left, so I'm just going to fill. I've got some little pint jars. Now, what I could do with this is I could use it just plain, or I could add it to my salves or add it to other um, things I'm making. Ear oil. Um, the mullen is for the ears. I'm going to show you. Oops. I'm going to show you a little bit of that um, ear oil. Oops. That's the wrong one. There we go. Okay, these ones are done. I'm just gonna put them down here to just set them aside. Now, um, um, the mullen, I wanna show you the mullen because I harvested a bunch more mullen. And like I said, it's an antiviral. It's really one of the best antivirals out there in our area, I know. And, um, but I just wanted you to be able to recognize it because, you know, you can't really totally tell from this. This is the mullen oil 
ear oil that I made. And so I just wanted to show you, this is a fully dried bunch that I picked recently. So I'm just gonna show you the fully dried and then the partially dried one. So you just get an idea of what the mullen actually looks like, you see. It kind of reminds me of um, bunny ears. <laughs> now, if you think of a bunny, it really does. It, it looks like bunny ears, and then it gets these beautiful stalks that grow yellow flowers. And everything is good, the, the, um, the leaves, the flowers, all of it. And then I'll just show you, this is a bit of a, a bigger plant with a larger flower stalk on it. And it's about half dried. I've had it for about three days, probably drying. It's got the big flower. It's got all the leaves. That's the mullen. This leaf isn't very pretty, but most of them are really quite nice. Okay. I just wanted to let you see um, that. And, excuse me, another update on our herbal um, information. That is that our class is going to be scheduled for September 30th. We're going to have Zoe Bartholomew come and teach us how to make a tincture kit for emergency childbirth in the unexpected setting. And it goes in an ammo box. She's going to have the morning on the 30th. We're going to be learning that. In the afternoon, we're actually going to try to buy the supplies and people can just, you know, pay the cost and we'll sit and make them in the afternoon. And then we'll um, head out to the mineral pools for a soak. And then the next day we're going to do foraging. Um, we've got a, uh, one of our circle ladies, Ruth, a student midwife who has a lot of knowledge, lives in the Teutonia area, has a good herbal walk for us to go on. So we're going to go forage. Maybe we'll actually gather some mullen, um, some sage. And she had about three other ones that she knows of that I'm not even totally familiar with. So I'm excited about that on the 31st of September. So the second one I'm going to do with you, just to strain it out. Um, I just need a minute here to get my strainer back. Um, let me see here. I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put this in here. Okay. So I've got my strainer again. This is the mullen. And what I decided to do, I was going to put garlic in this. And then I decided, no. I wanted to keep it plain because I like to add this to my salve. I like to use it plain on rashes and stuff like that, not necessarily having the garlic smell. And then I'm going to make a separate one in a bottle like this, and I'm going to add um, garlic in it and let it um, sit, sit in the garlic. So I'm just pouring this. This is the mullen. You can really see the color is really darkened from the mullen, which is really nice. It is olive oil, but it wasn't anywhere near the stark on this side. And you can see the le the leaves are all crispy too. It's kind of neat how they they kind of preserve. They don't go rotten. It's kind of neat, especially like I've put this under the moon multiple times. I've put it out under the sun multiple times too. Okay, now there is our mullen oil. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> Simple, simple, simple way to extract um, oil from these products, from these um, Heavenly Mother's Earth, Heavenly Father's Earth. Okay, I'm going to pour this in here. Just like I said, be really careful not to overfill them. I find you can't fill them too much because then when you put the, the especially if it has a dropper, you'll end up wasting it. And I've got more of these nice little... Um, and this one's labeled, I have a little reusable label on there. You can't see it very good. I need to get a white pen. I have a silver pen to label this. And I'm just going to pour this in here. And this would have to be kept in a dark place, but I have a really nice apothecary closet where I keep all my medicine so it's kept in a dark, dry place. And this is the mullen oil. And put the lid on it. Put it over here so I remember. And I've got one more that I'm going to do. I'm going to just pour the rest of this into this container. 
I hope you're doing well. I'm excited to share um, more information about midwifery with you too. So I feel like we're going to be needing it coming up very soon. More and more, you know, as we move into these un unstable days, like civil unrest, and of course with viruses and things getting, you know, coming out, that's, you know, creates the need for out of hospital birth at times. And so it's kind of what we're doing. You're getting ready for that. Okay. Last but not least, <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones, the Arnica. I mean, it is just, oh, the smell of that is amazing. Actually, the melon is amazing too. So is the rose. Oh, yeah, these are. These are potent. They're very. They do really draw out the properties of the um, the uh, flowers and the leaves. Okay, so there's the. This is the um, arnica extraction, oil extraction. You can see again how the flowers kind of go crispy as they kind of self-preserve a little bit. And that's the, the Arnica flowers. And then you could let that sit for a while. I'm going to let it sit in this other pot so it drips. And I just lost my funnel. <laughs> so I'm just going to grab the funnel off the floor. Okay, hang on. Okay, here we go. So now we're going to do our last pour. Which is our um, our last pour is our mullen. There we go. And I'm also gonna pour it off the rest of it off. Right here. There we go. And that's it. Great. Okay. So you got to see that a little bit of follow through on that. I like to get them with, um, with droppers because then you can, you know, you can measure it out and then you can write you know, your mullen. So I'm going to put that over here with my mullen. All right. Now let's get into the other part for helping mothers and babies. This is my specialty area. <laughs> Herbs are my specialty area too because I've worked with herbs. Excuse the noise. I just want to resituate this so the light's not shining in my face quite as much. So you can actually see me. Okay. Get out of the way. I think I've got everything now. So I hope you're all well. And um, if you have any questions or things that you actually want to learn and you want me to teach, on here um, just leave me a message you can private message me that's probably the best thing at um, Charlene at birthjoyeducation.com okay and just let me know if there's certain topics of specifically to do with childbirth and responding safely in the out-of-hospital setting that you would like more information about and I'll do my best okay all right so for now let's go through we've got our list this is from my manual. You can, you can actually order this manual online if you're interested at midwiferytoday.com. And they have a really nice online bookstore, midwiferytoday.com. They carry five of my education films, um, which are all based on the same thing. And they also carry um, the manual. Okay, so we're gonna go through, this is the list that we've been going through of emergency procedures that would be good to know um, how to do. Some of them are emergency, some of them are just skills that um, the midwives would be happy if you knew. And even if there was no midwife there, it's still, it's a really good skill for you to know. Okay, where did we end? We ended 
I think we ended on preparing medications in the syringe and administering these antihemorrhagics. And we talked about, you know, that oftentimes midwives will carry oxytocin or other he antihemorrhage drugs. And to know how to actually draw up a medication, make sure that, you know, you've read it and, and discerned it's correct and you've got the correct dosage. And then, you know, being able to actually know how to inject that into a woman, either in her arm or in her leg. Now, one of the things in this book, I'll just briefly show you this because it is very comprehensive. I actually took these photographs myself with my student and we actually went through and took photos. Okay, I'm not gonna go through it right now because I can't find it, but it, we went through and we took photos of every single process of the injection process, of the IV process, of the injection process. So those are both in my manual. It's $39, so it's really reasonable. Okay, um, but let's, let's continue on here. The next one is um, administering neonatal resuscitation as needed. Now, we actually went over that in the last video. Um, I went over how to do mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation. Um, and I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about that. Um, the main thing about that is to not panic, to realize that babies take about a minute to transition onto room air, but they're still attached by the cord, getting plenty of oxygen and blood normally. But you still need to stimulate them and position them so they can breathe, you know, on their mom's chest is, is often a really good place. Sometimes we talked also about having the baby, if the baby's not quite breathing or they seem like they have mucus, to hold them in a um, in a inverted um, position like this, so that the baby can cough up any mucus or spit up any mucus, it also helps them to be stimulated by put, um, giving strokes from the back of the spine, the base of the spine, up to the neck several times, and then checking to see if they're breathing, and then wiping the face. So we talked about that in the last video, you can go and be reminded. Um, and then of course the mouth to mouth resuscitation is, or you could have a shield. I mean, you, you know, whatever you're feeling comfortable to do, but I, I just teach mouth to mouth because the parents can do it. Um, it's not that hard to learn. Um, it's a simple thing compared to trying to use an ambu bag like we do in, in the more medical professional um, uh, situations where as midwives we do use bamboo bags and also in the hospital they use them but we also learn how to do mouth to mouth as routine I do and and I encourage everybody to do that in case your bag isn't working or you're not getting a good seal or you're out and you don't have a bag there could be a number of reasons why you don't have a bag or a mask so all right let's keep going though with that um, there's also a lot of more information in my films on that too. If you really are serious and you want more on that, you can go study that. Um, performing McRoberts and suprapubic pressure. Now, I don't know if anybody understands what that is, um, but let me explain, okay? Um, when I just want to first tell you what shoulder dystocia is so you get kind of get an idea. It could be called sticky shoulder, could be called shoulder dystocia. I prefer the term sticky shoulder because it, it, it kind of gives the idea that it's going to come out, you know. It can come out. It's just stuck a little bit and we're going to get it out of there. And just remember that the, you know, the pelvis is made from a lot of different bones that are put together by cartilage and that cartilage softens and stretches and is mobile especially in the weeks preceding the birth, the mother's body literally excretes a hormone called relaxin, and it helps this entire pelvis be moldable and movable, which causes the baby to be able to come out, especially if the mother is upright and mobile. And so, and, tr and trusting her own intuition, and that really helps a lot if the mother can be um, encouraged to trust herself to listen to her body and to be the sovereign decision maker about what she's doing with our support rather than um, just being told what to do which takes her power away 
when mothers are really given their power, they actually instinctually know exactly what they need to do. So often they'll just move their body in a certain way and the baby will just get unstuck. We don't even need to do anything. So a lot of times if we really empower women, it makes our job, well, anytime we do that, it makes our job a thousand times easier as anyone who's supporting a mother in childbirth. So let's remember that. But let's get back to this. So um, the idea is this that the baby has to make certain maneuvers and rotations to come down into the pelvis, okay? The baby turns and does rotations. Now, at one of the rotations, which is just, just right down here by the ischial spines, these are the ischial spines, I don't know if you can see them, but they're the most prominent spot on the passageway that the baby has to maneuver. Of course, the tailbone's there too, but really it's the ischial spine. So the baby turns different ways. Now, at one point, once the baby's head is out, or, or not out, but partially out usually, sometimes when this we're in this one rotation, this head or this um anterior, this is the anterior of the mother, the front. Now this anterior shoulder can get kind of stuck right there behind the pubic bone, okay? And when that happens, what this list is, is suggesting is that it would be important to know how to perform McRoberts and suprapubic pressure. Now, I think there's other things that are good to know how to perform too. Like one of the things that we do right away is get the mom on her hands and knees. And almost every single time, if you get her on her hands and knees, um, it'll just, it'll kind of give enough room for this other shoulder down here to get more loosened and it'll help the baby come out. But if you had to do McRoberts, um, there's two ways to do it. You can do it front with the mother on her, you know, on her front or on her back, which is the typical way they do it in the hospital. Or you can also do it up against the wall with a lot of people supporting the women if you have no success with the other ones. Um, and how you do it is you have the mom um, put her legs full back well, you help her, one person on each side, you pull them right back up. I'm actually gonna show you a picture of this. Hang on a minute now. It takes more than one person to really demonstrate this. But I have some photographs that um, Valerie, the midwife, and I, just to plug my computer in, it's so good. Valerie Hall, who has Generations Home Birth here in Idaho Falls, and she covers, you know, from Rexburg, Ashton, out to Pocatello with her team of midwives. And um, so she came over and she helped. This is another book that I have um, available if people want it. It goes with the video that goes with it, labor and delivery training. And I'll show you the, the uh, just an example of what that looks like. A Mick Roberts. Okay. Yeah, we've got little pictures in here. Here's a, like here's the one in the back, the McRoberts at the back, you see? I don't know if you can see. I've got one person on one side of the mother holding this knee right up by her shoulders as wide as she can get it. This one too, pushing as wide as she can get it there. Mother might even be holding her legs and pulling them back too. And um, the other way here is the forward way here is where the mom's got her legs really wide open and she's leaning forward with them as wide as possible. Now you can't really do the McRoberts or the um, supra pubic pressure in that position because it's, um, it's on the front and you can't access it very well unless you put your hands around and push in. But... Um, if you are doing super pubic pressure, basically what you're doing is you can see, usually see part of the head. Usually the head will be kind of coming out, but not too far. It'll be right around the ears, but it's, it looks like the neck isn't ready, ready to come out for some reason. And it just isn't coming with the contractions. So then you need to take action of changing the mother's position is the main thing that helps that. Okay. But now if you were doing um, supra pubic pressure. Basically what you do is you find, you look at which side is the back. You can see the baby's face on that side. So you know, this is the back. 
you're going to use a lot of pressure. You're going to use both hands and you're going to push the shoulder. So you're actually making, you know, if the shoulders are like this, you're actually pushing the shoulders together like that is what you're doing. So you're pushing just above the pubic bone with your, um, this part of your hand like this, and you're just pushing that shoulder to the opposite side as the back so that it goes like this. And that makes the shoulder diameter really small and the baby will almost always come out too. If it doesn't, you just keep changing positions, okay? And following the instructions. I'm not gonna go into tons of detail, but I'm going through this list and that I think that's, that's good for that one, okay. Another one is clamping and cutting a tight nuchal cord. You know, we never do that. We, do, we don't cut them anymore. I mean, this is probably something a lot of midwives, if you looked in like the research books and stuff like that, or the, you know, the textbooks, they would want you to be able to know how to do that. But the honest truth is that I deliver and, or well, I don't deliver them. The mother delivers the babies. I catch or support that birth and I don't ever cut the cord on the neck, on the perineum. Why? Because the cord is full of blood. Basically the oxygen supply and blood supply of, you know, 30 to 50% of the baby is still left in there. Okay. So, so we leave the cord and we somersault the baby out. I'm just going to give you a little lesson on that. So you can know that. Okay. And I think that's all we're going to do today. I'm going to keep it really short today so that more people will watch it <laughs> because sometimes they're too long. People don't have enough time. So I'm just going to keep them as short as I can. Okay. All right. So this is how you help a baby come out that has the cord wrapped around the neck. Okay. So I have a big long video on this earlier if you want to check it out, but I'll just give a little basic one on this. Um, say the cords around the neck like that. Okay. The baby, you see the baby's head coming out. Maybe you did have a shoulder dystocia and you had to try different things. You did um, hands and knees, then you turned them on back and you did McRoberts and you did super perfect pressure and the baby came out. You have mother push only with contractions because the body is, let's face it, doing the greater portion of the work. And if you're not working in synergistically with the body, you're not going to have the effect you want. So you let the mother rest in between contractions. If you have to stimulate contractions and you really want to get the baby out quicker, you know, it feels like it's taking a while for another contraction to come because it could take two or three contractions with the baby's head sitting there. That's okay. The baby still has the cord attached. Be patient. The baby will come. Don't panic and never pull on the head or, or try to twist it or anything like that. Just be patient and do the position changes, um, the super pubic pressure. Um, and let's talk about the cord. Once you've got the baby, so the head's out and then the, you know, the baby's starting to come out and you can kind of see there's cord around the neck, right? Don't panic. Just, just, just take a breath. <sighs> take a breath. Realize that you have help there and that you're going to do the, what's called the somersault move. Okay. <laughs> this is easy. This is easy. I've done this and it is so easy. And you go into instinctual autopilot too, where you kind of know exactly which way to turn the baby. You know, you don't necessarily have to think about it so much. It just kind of happens when you just go into instinct. So the idea is though that you keep the baby's head close to the mother's vagina in choritus or opening, whatever you want to call it. And there, you allow the babies to somersault. As the body's coming out, you just kind of somersault the baby up so that the reasoning is that this cord could be short now that it's wrapped. You don't want to tug on it. You don't want to pull on it. You don't want to put extra pressure on it. So you're keeping this cord and the baby's head close to the mother's body, right? And then as soon as the baby comes out, you just go like this and Almost always the baby will just come around. You may have to dry the baby off. You know, keep the baby skin to skin with the mom. Let the mother explore the baby. Let the mother um, make her own initiation toward the baby. Like mothers can be shocked right after they have a baby. 
And it's better to let them naturally imprint and make choices in a sovereign way right after because it helps their um, bonding process for them and the baby. And it helps the imprinting and the really sensitive imprinting of the baby's nervous system to create a healthy capacity to, for love and trust when you don't disrupt that, okay? And so, when, so you want to keep the baby skin to skin. You want to, you know, stimulate the baby, dry the baby, keep the baby cool, uh, warm, like no drafts in the room. Keep the doors closed, keep it quiet, and keep it, the energy down. So not too much discussion, not too much loud, rowdy, party type atmosphere, which can be really not conducive to the hormonal cocktail. And we talked about how important the hormone cocktail is to keep the mother's body functioning and going forward with the proper contractions and everything like that. And I did talk about that you could do some nipple stimulation if you needed to get contractions going. Um, and yeah, so the, the next thing that we're going to talk about is um, taking fetal heart tones on the mother. Okay, and we're going to do that next time. I hope you have a wonderful Sabbath day and um, I hope you've enjoyed my offering and sharing for today. Again, please like my videos and share them because this knowledge will save many lives in the days to come. And may you have a blessed day. Bye-bye.